Welcome to the Success Story Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Clary. On this podcast, I have candid interviews with execs, celebrities, politicians, and other notable figures, all who have achieved success through both wins and losses, to learn more about their life, their ideas, and their insights. I sit down with leaders and mentors and unpack their story to help pass those lessons on to others through both experiences and tactical strategy for business professionals, entrepreneurs, and everyone in between. Without further ado, another episode of the Success Story Podcast. Thanks again for sitting down with me. Uh, very excited to be sitting with Andrew Undum. He's uh, a real estate entrepreneur. He has uh, over a decade of experience in real estate. Um, he is the founding partner at Sure Sales Group um, that he uh, has been sort of driving forward since 2014. Uh, their organization now has grown to over 20 agents and staff and their annual sales are consistently over hundred and twenty million dollars. Um, now Andrew uh, is making a name for himself in real estate and not only just through his successes but he's also uh, very heavy on sales, marketing, uh, branding. Um, to speak through some of the, uh, the items that he's accomplished over his career, he's been featured in, a, in the Wall Street Journal um, as a top team, uh, his the sure group being a top team in the US. Uh, he uh, f- was featured in Bomb Bomb as a top video influencer. Uh, he uh, received a social media award from uh, Baltimore um, for obviously the work he's doing in the brand he's building uh, through Sure Group. Um, he's in the Remax Hall of Fame and he has a Circle of Legends award. Uh, he, re- he frequently does podcasts, uh, obviously real estate and, and other. And he is a various uh, panel speaker, keynote speaker, certified DRS agent. So obviously, Andrew is not just in real estate. He is, uh, you know, he's uh, a brand. He's uh, he's a persona, and he's and he's doing it purposefully. And I want to sort of, you know, thank you for sitting down. But I want to sort of unpack um, where where your head's at, like where you started off, how you came to be, and why you're doing uh, all the things that you're doing. Well, that was an awesome intro. I've never been uh, introduced with such a litany of. A bullet point there. I don't think I've been a keynote speaker before, but maybe one day, like you, Scott, I, I could, I can uh, pull that off. But um, so yeah, thanks. Been in real estate for ten years. Started uh, out as a finance guy out of college, uh, 2009. Um, so I'm a young guy, 32, and coming out of college and like the, you know, after 08, 09, being in finance, super tough. So I ended up taking a different route, and I ended up getting into real estate in the new home sales world. So I worked with one of the top builders in the country, had an awesome experience there. And um, after about three years of that, I'd had about enough. And I said, you know, I'm going to start my own thing and get into the residential brokerage world. And it's kind of taken off ever since. And uh, we've been growing every year. We've had some pretty good hockey stick growth. And I attribute it, a lot of it is, is to following guys like yourself and always be constantly learning and improving in each kind of functional silo of your business, whether it's sales, marketing, negotiation, mindset, et cetera. Um, so happy to be here and happy to share anything I can with your audience. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Um, so first let's unpack like, like your story. So like, you know, you said you, you went finance, real estate. What was like your driver that, that brought you into finance and then and made you want to go into real estate? Like, is that something that you've always wanted to do or do you have like a knack for it? You found you were Great at sales, like a you know working uh, like retail or whatever. I don't know what what's what's your story that sort of led you to to want to jump into real estate. Well, if I'm being honest, I was always really motivated by making money, and that's kind as, of what as any for. good salesperson should be. So, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, it's just growing up, you look around, it's like wow, money. You're like these like little fun tickets. This is a tool you can use to do things that you want to do, and you get a lot of independence from that. And of course, it's not the old cliche. It's not the money itself. It's what you can do with the money, what you can do for other people with the money. So I just knew it was a powerful tool and that's kind of what I wanted to pursue. Um, And that's kind of what happened with the finance game. And how I got into real estate is actually pretty funny. Right after I graduated college, I started selling cars just for nine months, short stint, couldn't get a job in finance, figured I'd sell something. I'd sold cars in the summers in college. Um, Then my parents helped me get a job. Um, so I wasn't sitting around just being a beatnik all day. I ended up selling a car to one who was a, a manager. This person was a manager at Ryan Homes, NVR Inc., one, you know, the darling of the uh, new home builders in, in Wall Street's world, big builder. And she said, Andrew, do you like working here? And we had such good rapport at this point, like we were buddy-buddy. 
I said, you know, I actually hate it. Thanks so much for asking. I wake up at 9 a.m. I don't leave till 9 p.m. It's dark when I get up, dark when I get home. I work six days a week. Dealerships are open every day besides Sunday. But no, I mean, but I had a good attitude about it. So she saw it. She said, you should sell houses instead. That kind of, I didn't know anything about real estate up until that point. I have some family ties. Um, you know, my mom's family does some real estate stuff up in North Dakota, Minnesota, but nothing for me personally. But it was at that car dealership where I met a guy who was really involved in sales training and sales consulting. And that really changed the trajectory of my career because I started practicing these different sales techniques. You know, someone walks into the dealership, what do you do? You don't just go up and say, take you to the car. No, you have to be really polished and professional. We were doing Porsches and Audis. So I was dealing with really um, kind of top-notch business people, awesome people to do business with. And so I, I kind of took a lot of that training I got over to real estate and um, the rest was kind of history. Then just up, up, and away we went and never took our foot off the gas. So, so I like that story. And I, and I think that um, a lot of people that uh, are in sales, uh, there's a, a gentleman uh, by the name of Rob Jepson. I consume a lot of his content. He has a sales podcast. And I think one of the things that he says is um, uh, accident, I, the quote, what is the quote exactly? It says something along the lines of like, accidentally involved, but purposefully successful or something like something along those lines. Like nobody plans to get into sales, but when you're in it and when it doesn't matter if it's, it's software, it's, it's homes, it's cars, people who love it, love it. And they love it for money. They love it for accomplishment. They love it for, they love it for controlling, uh, like what they have, they, they help, they hold themselves to accountability as to like what they can achieve. Um, now a lot of people, I think, uh, move over to a profession like real estate and they would stop as just a real estate agent. But you're taking it to the next level. You're building out your entire organization, which is now um, one of the top brokerages uh, in, in the US. Um, you know, there's obviously some very big names, but uh, in Baltimore, especially, like you are like one of the, if not the uh, largest uh, brokerages. So how do you, you know, that's an entrepreneur. Um, that's an entrepreneur venture at the end of the day. So how did you move from uh, just selling to building a business? Yeah, that's a good question. It's, um, you know, there's a lot of good real estate teams in, in Baltimore. We happen to be the number one REMAX team in the state. Um, but there's, there's a lot of really good professionals in residential real estate, great people to learn from. And there's also a lot of people who are just struggling to figure it out. And real estate's one of those businesses that I'm sure your audience is aware of. Anyone can be a realtor. Everyone knows 10 real estate agents because the barrier to entry is, if it was any lower, Scott, you just trip over it and knock your teeth out. Like anyone, <laughs> can be, anyone can be an agent. And that's the problem. And, you know, attorneys and doctors kind of have that different barrier to entry. But in sales in general is a kind of typically an eat what you kill environment. They're willing to bring you on and throw you into the deep end. So, but to answer your question, how do we kind of start growing this business? What I found is there's only one thing that matters and it's giving the clients exactly what they want. And that's just sales in general. And that means you have to be really good at listening. You have to be really all in on helping people get what they want. And in today's environment with all the technology, you can't sell real estate the way you used to. It used to be a solo operation and there'd be you know, maybe 10 agents over here. They all kind of did their own thing, had a little friendly competition. That doesn't work anymore because you need to deliver so much value to the marketplace if you expect clients to work with you. So in building out our organization, we realized, hey, we need a full-time in-house videographer with drone capabilities. So anytime, Scott, if I'm going to go list your condo, I'm going to be circling the drone around the building, getting some sweet B-roll of the gym and all the other cool stuff in the condo building. And I'm going to create some compelling content about your home. Not just take, and of course, I call it of course marketing. Of course you take the pictures and the signs and the brochures and all the other stuff that maybe even some other agents don't do. And then of course you're going to have to have someone to handle all the paperwork and do all the back office. And really you have to put the right people in the right places on the bus, like, like Jim Collins would say. And let the salespeople just do what they're best at and go out and sell and serve and have a system in the back end that works. So that's kind of where we're pushing all of our energy into is how do we arm good salespeople, great salespeople 
with everything they need so they don't have to do the $10, $15, $20 an hour work, and they can go do the highest and best activities that are gonna lead to, you know, them hitting their goals and having a good bottom line. So you really just gotta treat it like a business. And unfortunately, in real estate, because you can get your license and you can go sell your cousin's house and maybe have a little bit of success, that behavior is kind of rewarded so much that people keep coming in and doing it. But there's 1.3 million real estate agents, uh, at least in the U.S., and 50% of them don't even sell a house a year. So that, that'll give you an idea. So, so that all makes sense. Um, the way you build up the business, the way that you, you make sure that the right people are doing the right job, the, you know, the, the customer success, um, paying attention to the details and whatnot, and sort of like, you know, delivering excellence to the customer while still enabling the sales individuals and whatnot to sort of be as effective as possible. Um, but that, is that something that you found intuitively? Like, how did you, I guess what I'm trying to draw out is why are not more, uh, brokerages doing what you're doing and not just like all these things you're saying are like the, the, the bare minimum for most businesses to succeed. But like you said, a lot of real estate, uh, agents, they have a little bit of success, but that's good enough or whatever. I don't know. I'm sure there's a lot of top brokerages that also do what you're, you're speaking about, but oh, sure. what, like, obviously you're doing it very effectively and, and very quickly I find as well. So how did you, how did you come to this conclusion? Like you've never built a business before. So what was like, what was the sort of like your guiding light, your principles sort of led you here? Well, I know why a lot of people don't do it because it's really hard. Managing people is hard. There's in real estate, there's no salaries, no insurance, no nothing. And I know a lot of B2B sales uh, roles, you know, you have this company package, maybe get some base salary, some bonus. There's a little net here. In this business, you take on so much because the buck stops with you. People always like to think, oh, but there's no ceiling you can make unlimited amount of money, which is true. But what they don't talk about is there's also no floor. You can plummet yourself in debt. You can max out these credit cards and just go bananas and ho just hope it works. So it, it is a lot of hard work to build organically from scratch. It's very um, real estate's awesome because anybody can get into it. And with the right attitude, mindset, hustle, and entrepreneurial spirit, you can build it, which I love about it. They should let it, it be semi-easy to join. And I think it works relatively well. It weeds a lot of people out. 87% of people get out in the first five years, which is a wild statistic. I don't think any mm -hmm. other industry is like that. Um, Leaving the whole industry, probably, probably not. No, that's, that's, that's pretty crazy. crazy. That yeah. means one out of 10, if you look around at all your colleagues, 90% are gone in five years. And then again, and then again, it's every, every five years. Um, but how we build it, we had a lot of help. And... Um, I know when I've talked to you before, I dropped this word, so I'm going to use it again, but you have yeah. to be an autodidact, which is just a, a nice polysyllabic word. Um, do you want to write that down? Autodidact. You just have to be a self-taught person. You have to be so hungry to figure out what's going to get you to the next level because what got you here won't get you there and vice versa. How you sell 10 homes is not how you sell 50, 100. And, you know, last year we did like 460 a whole different slew of problems at each tier. And I'll tell you what, the other people who are doing it, they're not the people who are gonna come in and try to help you rise. Mm -hmm. They're gonna be taking their lunch a little bit. So you really have to be just that kind of student mindset, go out in a, and just soak up as much knowledge as you can. And it's not just, you know, there's a couple of columns I'd like to think in our business, which is, hey, you have to know how to sell real estate. That's one skill set. Know all the contracts, know the right process, how the whole operation works with buyers, sellers, mortgage company, title company, home inspections, contingencies, lawyers. There's a whole lot of going on there, a whole lot of um, different personalities and, and people to have to deal with. It's a tough thing to navigate, which is probably why so many people fail, because it's not just you selling your friend a house. There's a whole lot of people and everyone's seriously involved and there's a ton of money changing hands, yeah. every transaction. You better be sharp on that. But just because you know how to sell real estate doesn't mean you know how to sell. Sales is its own skill and it's its own thing you need to pursue mastery in. And most real estate salespeople, realtors, whatever you want to call them, have never had any sales training. Now they can navigate the process. 
you know, it's like a dentist. They know how to pull the teeth and do this, but do they know how to actually sell themselves on the service? Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of missing in the industry in a lot of ways. There's a, there's a whole bunch of great training. Most of it's motivation, mindset, get after it. I'm talking hardcore sales training. Oh, probably like the stuff you went through and, you know, with the companies you run, like you got to learn the sales process. And then after that is the management component. How do we bring this all together and grow it to something bigger than yourself? And that's what gets me excited is uh, now, making it a worthwhile pursuit. I like that a lot. And I like that you sort of double down on, on the, the proper training to enable people. And that's probably why, uh, like I'm sure if, if you named off some stats of people that work with your firm, they're very much not aligned with the rest of the industry in terms of, of their successes and their retention rate of like your, your realtors. Um, but what I, I think is also interesting is you've focused on something that I'm a firm believer in, and that's branding, self-branding, marketing, um, social media. Like I'm looking at this list of things that you've, that you sort of done and, and places you've been featured in and, and various publications. Obviously branding is important for both sure and, and for yourself. And I apologize for calling you um, a keynote. I didn't mean to. I saw a panel speaker. I just figured, oh, he speaks a lot. He must have done it once or twice. No, I've been like invited but, to a panel once, but it sounded good. Now I have something to aspire to. Like, listen, hey, I like got it's, something to say. Hire me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, no. Listen, you'll uh, you'll you'll get it eventually if you keep this up. It doesn't take long for the requests to start coming in, and especially now with um with everyone's you know everyone's sitting at home right now, unfortunately. But uh, people are having all these virtual conferences and it's, and it's very easy to just, like I, I get tons of requests just to chat about this, that, and the other. Like, and it's, it's a great easy way to build out your brand because some of these organizations that host these events, they have big followings and whatnot and you don't have to travel. You don't have to take four hours of your night. You're just hopping on a Zoom call and you have access to their entire, so you know, that's one thing that I love doing now. Um, but anyways, that's, that's, uh, sort of getting off topic. So why are you focusing on building out, you know, your brand, um, and also the brand of the company and why are you so heavy on social media when real estate, which is, I think we can agree is a very, well, obviously it's one of the, probably the oldest industries that you can, you know, you can, you can think of a lot of these companies, you look at their social media to be quite honest, it sucks. Like it's just horrible. It's horrifying what they think is acceptable to, to post. So and this is not, this is not so different than a lot of like Fortune 100, Fortune 500. Like there's very few companies that I find get it. And that's why I think it's so interesting that like these startups or even these solopreneurs or, or individuals can build a brand for themselves that is equivalent, if not more exciting and engaging than what a Fortune 500 entire marketing department can do. So, you know, you're, you're doing this properly. And, and, and why is that? And, and speak to me about why you, you, you see the, the use for it. Why? Well, you know, the brand is so important if you want to stand out in a crowded marketplace. And when, you know, the, the rise of social media happened, and like Gary Vaynerchuk talks about this a lot, but the playing field just got leveled. Like, you know, Mercedes Benz can make this a beautiful commercial. Well, I have a camera too. My iPhone X Pro and a little bit of editing, I could make something almost as awesome. And once you realize that you can put out super high quality content, now it's not easy and you're going to mess it up. I've made every mistake putting out a video that's known to man, at least as far as I can tell. So you got to fail forward, just throw yourself out there. But it, the branding is so important because if you don't get attention, if you don't get people to know what you do, why you do it, how you do it, why you might be better, then you're never going to get the chance to even have the conversation. So there's the old age old thing, marketing versus sales, marketing and sales. And they're both equally as important because, you know, hey, salespeople like to say, oh, sales is the king. Sales skills, number one, number one. And, you know, I'm kind of in that camp a lot of times. But if you don't have anyone to talk to, if, if you're not getting opportunities and you can't market, it doesn't matter how great your mindset is and how great your presentation is if you can't give it to anybody. And same thing, vice versa, though. Like there's there's you got to marry those two together and give them equal amount of energy and effort. Because if you do, if you are good at marketing and we, like you said, we spend a ton of time on that. Every time we list a house for sale, I don't care how um, low the price range might be. I don't care the location. We do everything full blast all the time. Cause if it's going to have our brand on it, we want you to know you're getting world-class photography hundreds of HDR pictures that we're going to take down and maybe use the best 30, 40, or 50. We're going to get the drone out and get some aerial footage. 
we're going to do a video, whether that's me on a green screen explaining the house with, you know, the pictures coming up in the background or me physically at the property, giving you the kind of HGTV, here's all the things you need to know about this house that you might miss if you just looked at the pictures. So we create all this content and that's very important. And let's be honest, that does help sell the seller on you. Now, the only way it's going to help you actually sell the house and, and deliver on your promise is if you know how to distribute that content. Uh, and Scott, you know this. You put out amazing content all the time. So I'm preaching to the choir. But for your audience, it's like, um, and I know you've had some help. I think your girlfriend's like in the game, help, you know, as a consultant. Oh, yeah. No, world. like, listen, like, even even she does, uh, She she's into, uh, like, the whole social media scene. She runs a marketing company with her sisters. So she's very much, like, you know, <laughs> like, head first into the, the whole social media. And that's that's what literally her entire business is. Now, it's not my entire business, but it's still, you know, I, I've, I've been a, a fan, um, putting it lightly, since, since I, I saw the opportunity and I saw the, the ability for like the, just the individual to make, to have that kind of reach with like very few marketing dollars. That's what I find so incredible. And so uh, the opportunity is right, like really, really fresh still. So. Yeah, I mean, it's fertile soil. And like, yeah. if you follow Scott at all, like the book you just put out is going to be awesome. I did order it, by the way, it hasn't came yet. Um, but this guy's like a, an amazing influencer on LinkedIn. And it's because you have to do, you have to create the content. And everyone kind of has a hard time with that. Is, do I look okay? Is what I'm saying good enough? Am I going to be able to impact somebody? Do I need a better guest? And then even if you can cross that bridge and capture this content with some decent audio and video. You have to know how to distribute it. And in my world, that is very important because we're hyper-local. Real estate's hyper-local. So just to answer your question, like we went so big on branding because we want to be known as the people who do it right the first time, get it done. You know, if you think hiring us is expensive, try hiring someone else and then you have to list it twice. Go yeah. cheap and do it twice kind of thing. So it's very important you... for every business. Now, now I, I, one thing I like to, to pull out of this is like, you know, your, your agents, uh, how comfortable are they selling like this? Because I don't see, again, a lot of brands doing this. So when they, when they join, when they join sure group, um, is that sort of like a, a little bit uncomfortable for somebody that's been selling for, you know, 20 years, 30 years? Yeah, you know, it can be, and it's not like we run this, um, Auschwitz camp where it's like, you have to do it this way. Yeah, <laughs> we, we like to grow people on it and everyone does things a little bit differently. So the way I sell is going to be different than the way you sell. It's going to be different than the way, you know, each agent on our team sells. But what we want to do is we want to give them the canvas, hand them the right tools. Hey, this is available to you. This is at your disposal and show them a lot of examples. Like I think one of the things we've done well uh, at the Sure Sales Group here in Baltimore is we lead from the front. I'm not asking people to do things that I'm not doing all the time myself. And it's very often that when you grow a team that the CEO or pre these, they, these realtors call themselves CEOs all the time. I find it hilarious. I'm just a realtor like everyone else. I happen to you know, kind of manage some of the team. But what this managing partner will do, they'll take themselves out and just direct everyone else what to do and just collect. And that's okay for a little bit, but this market changes so much and the industry changes so much, just like all of our industries. And if you're not sitting at the kitchen tables eating what you kill, understanding the buyer and seller personas and how they're changing as different technology comes into the marketplace and different disruptors come in, you're going to fall behind. So all we do is try to, we're in it every day and, I, and we have our weekly meeting and we share. We say, look, this is what worked for me. Like last week, I just did a whole presentation on why 2008 crisis is different than this um, COVID-19 and I had all of the charts and I got like 10 referrals from it. God, it was crazy. I blasted it out to my database. Say, Hey, I wasn't trying to sell anything. Uh, this is why we think this is different. There's a lot more equity, equity in homes. Now people haven't been borrowing like crazy. The appreciation hadn't been crazy before this and yada, yada, yada. And I just shared that with my team and said, look, you guys should probably consider doing this. Rip off my presentation, do it yourself. So we, we do a lot of encouraging, but you don't have to do it. But if you're not going to do the behavior that we know leads to results, don't come crying to me that you're not mm -hmm. hitting your goals because it's 
I like that. The lead from the front. Um, I like the way you put that. And I think that's very relevant. It also speaks to, it, it, there's, there's so many things that you can take out of that. Um, like you're setting by example, like showing what works, giving them the tools, uh, doing it first. And, and I think that that can be used in, in any organization, right? To make employees feel comfortable, use it as a training tool, use it as an onboarding tool. Um, but I think that a lot of the things that I, you know, when I speak to you and I, and I hear you speak about how you run your firm in all seriousness, I I really enjoy it because there's so many things that you've done, whether or not intuitively or through trial and error, just, you know, iterating and seeing what works, what doesn't Um, you're obviously very self-aware of what works and what doesn't because even leading from the front and doing things before asking people to do them, it seems like such a, you know, common sense thing to do, but how many people do you know, like leaders that don't do that? And, and they're just saying, you know, do more or do this. And they don't even know how to do it themselves. Like it's, I don't know if you have thoughts on, on, on leadership as a, you know, outside of, of real estate, but I've seen that a lot, to be quite honest, where people don't take that attitude. And I think that's why a lot of leadership fails. A lot of, there's a lot of high turnover in sales. Um, a lot of people leave sales organizations because they feel like, you know, they're just being told to do more and not being told how to do it. Like these are all issues that a lot of companies deal with. Yeah, it's like, don't tell me, show me. Like, yeah. that's, uh, I like to say, hey, we, we play this game called show, don't tell. I'm going to show you. I'm not too, what happens, a lot of these managers will go to a conference or they listen to someone like you speak and you drop some really good ideas. And in our world, we're heavy on video. And that's something people are uncomfortable with, um, you know, putting themselves out there. So if they go to a conference and say, hey, video is really important. Look at all the leads you'll get if you do this right on Facebook. And they come back to their team and say, you guys got to do all this. You want to get the leads. And anyone can do that. Like any idiot can come in and just give you a good idea. But the, where the rubber meets the roads in the execution, and that's another thing that's been beaten to death. Ideas are shit, execution is everything. Mm-hmm. But if you peel it back a little bit deeper, you have to be really self-aware and kind of, you have to have your EQ buzzing at a high level on how it feels when you are executing something. So you might be able to actually take someone along the ride with you. Like, hey, I know it's uncomfortable. I know that you might not like the way this looks. Let's try it anyway. I'll stand here and, and give you some lines, or I'll leave if that makes you uncomfortable too, because sometimes it's weird when someone's over your shoulder. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes other people like it. And it's, you just have to, and that's, that's leading from the front. It's giving, it's just like we want to give our clients what, what they want. Yeah. We want to give our employees and the people who are helping and we're working together, let's give them what they want, but everybody's different. Yeah. Um, I wanted to, uh, I have a couple questions that are, are actually just more focused on like bringing out your knowledge about like what's going on with, because I think this would be very topical because people want to listen to obviously like the, how you built and how, you know, you've built success. But I also want to understand your I guess, viewpoint on what's happening to real estate market with like coronavirus, if you don't mind going down that road, I would love to get some of your thoughts on that as well. But I want it before I do that. Um, I guess for you know, how you have built this business and where you want to go into the future. Let's, let's, let's close that off. So I, I think that um, my question to you would be you've built this uh, agency, you built it successfully, you have the leadership lessons, the sales lessons, the marketing lessons that you've all done. And you, you're sort of you continuing to do obviously very well. Um, what do you see, or what are your goals for the agency? Where do you want to take it? Yeah, that's a good question. I think about that a lot. And um, one of the main goals has been, and still is, that I wanted to get to a point where we're selling a thousand homes a year. You know, it's like three a day, right? Very hard to do. And there's a handful of people who have done it, but everyone who has accomplished that has done it with these teams that are like 100 people, 150 people where, you know, agent Z doesn't know agent A and it's just like this kind of huge web. I want to try to do that with like less than 30 people, 30 agents. Now we're going to need some staff and that's doable. That means every agent would be having to sell like 36 units a year, three a month. You get 30 people selling three a month, you get to a thousand pretty quickly. So that's the goal. And it's going to be very hard to do because, and this has happened to us. We've had very low turnover, but people do leave. And I'm proud of them when they leave. because It's scary to go out on your own and leave our umbrella to do your own thing. Um, so you have to really have really good retention. But that's the goal. And um, we want to arm people that, hey, I want to be around other A players. 
And if you're going to be an A player, you would have the wherewithal and capability to go do this yourself. So I am okay with that. So that's the hardest part is how do I keep 30 Navy SEALs together when they want to go do their own thing? So you really have to be the keeper of the vision and, and never, never take your foot off the gas with that either because um, it's tough. And if, you, if, if the team doesn't follow that vision, they're going to go follow somebody else's vision. Yeah, no, agreed. Um, what I what I wanted to what I want to ask, I want to get your opinion on this because this is obviously relevant to leadership, and this is you'll this will make sense. <laughs> it's relevant okay. to leadership. It's because you're in real estate. I I follow. Um, I'm sure you know him, Ryan Sirhart, uh, Sirhan, excuse me, uh, like the million dollar listing guy, and he was speaking about um, an agency that had fired uh, a lot of their real estate agents in, in wake of COVID-19 coronavirus. Um, yeah, and I don't know if you know this story. So I, yeah. I'm curious as to what, like, why would that ever happen in real estate? And, and what kind of agency would do that? None of this makes any sense to me, to be quite honest. Okay. I don't get it. A couple of things. I've met Ryan Sirham, um virtually. He came into our sales meeting at the end of 2019 to give our team a pep talk. And it was awesome. And I get called Ryan Sirhan all the time because I have gray hair, I guess, or something like that. But people always say, you look like that guy. And it's flattering because he's like a big deal. And I'm not. <laughs> so Ryan Sirhan or anyone who knows Ryan Sirhan, if he's watching, I told him when we were on this conference call, million dollar listing, I can get to New York in three and a half hours. You show the penthouse, I'll show the first floor. I'll be mini Ryan Sirhan. I'm like 5'10", he's 6'4". Wear the same suit. It's quality television, guys. Million dollar listing. Um, side note, so the, what he was talking about was Redfin, which is this um, tech company that, that came into our industry and they have a bunch of salaried agents and they, they get a little bonus when they sell a house. And a lot of people give them a hard time about it. I think it's an interesting model. I actually bought, bought some of the stock at one point because I thought it made sense. They seem like some smart people running the show. But Ryan went on this diatribe about how it's so unfair that you're going to just take these people's jobs away. But what he was really doing was bashing a, this, this company, this tech company, who thought they could come in when the market was great mm. and use all these people. And then the minute it gets hard, just wipe them out, which is kind of oh, what I happened. understand. That's also, that's also really shitty. <laughs> that's really that's shitty. still very shitty. <laughs> yeah. And um, he made a lot of good points. I think I was watching the same thing. I think he put it out on LinkedIn. It was him just sitting in his living room. Yeah, yeah, really exactly. No, I have, I, I think, I can't remember if I'm like a second connection or if I'm actually connected to him. I've tried to get him, I've tried to message him, get him on the show. He hasn't answered me maybe one day, you know, fingers crossed. But, um, but uh, no, I, I remember seeing it and I just, I was sitting here like from like a, a, a person who's not involved. Well, not, not a, a, I, I enjoy understanding real estate as an investment opportunity, but I'm definitely not as heavily into it as, as you are. Um, so I just, I didn't make any sense to me knowing the traditional uh, model for like a realtor was zero, you know, zero dollar salary. So that's what we'll I was trying put to it figure this out. Way. If a realtor needs a salary, you probably don't want them working for you. Cause I mean, they're what I call an indoor cat. An indoor cat needs to be fed. They can't go out and kill anything and eat themselves like an outdoor cat. If you're going to go buy or sell probably maybe your most expensive asset, you know, half million, million dollars, you don't want the indoor cat. You don't want someone who couldn't make it in the, in the real world. So they took a salary and they're just playing this game with the tech company is feeding them all the time. You want your agent to be, of course, you have to have empathy and compassion, but you also need them to be, hey, this is cutthroat. If I'm representing you, I will get you every penny we possibly can. I'm going to get the deal done. I'm going to get you what you want. Now, who are you going to go with? Someone who's built a, built a company, who has all the resources, a crazy track record, selling hundreds of millions of dollars of real estate every year. Or Sally, she's got a five-star rating on Redfin. She has a 50K salary. You're in good hands. Good luck. Mm -hmm. So, of course, people don't, especially when the market gets hard, of course, you're not hiring Sally from Redfin. You're going to want someone you trust, someone who's going to put their money where their mouth is, someone who, oh, by the way, you don't give them a penny until they deliver you what you want. So, 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 so that makes more sense to me now knowing that their salary, it's not great. It's, it's always, you know, horrible when, when mass layoffs. And I think that, I think that anybody who is still working and still making money right now is very fortunate and they don't have to rely on a, a stimulus check if you're in the States or there's some 
opportunities where I'm at in Canada. Um, so it's just, it is very, it's very sad, but it's definitely not the same. Uh, it's not the same as laying off a whole bunch of uh, individuals who didn't make any money in the first place. So it makes, it makes more sense, but still what's happening with real estate and coronavirus? Like why, why would they? So a lot of companies are, are in my opinion, um, having knee jerk reactions, but yeah. Why would a real estate company have a knee jerk reaction? What are they noticing is it, just nothing selling, nothing moving markets are down price. Like, What's, what is the, the general atmosphere of real estate? Because you obviously see it. You live it every day. Well, we're still pretty bullish, at least here. Now, everything is hyper-local. So you got to keep that in mind. I'm here in Baltimore. Baltimore is one of these areas that um, a beautiful place doesn't get nationally recognized as a beautiful place, unfortunately. But look, Baltimore City, this is home to like, this is some 13 original colony stuff. This is East Coast. You got, yeah. Iron Man, Cal Ripken, Ravens, Orioles, Inner Harbor, amazing brick row homes, incredible downtown neighborhoods. Um, you don't hear about that. You just hear about crime, Baltimore, up. Um, so the reason I mention that is because over the last three to four years, everywhere else around the country was appreciating really hot. Everything was good. Economics were so strong. Everyone was super bullish. The stock market, everything was going up. Baltimore really wasn't. It just mm -hmm. stayed the same. So Baltimore is pretty resilient in the fact that what goes up does tend to come down when things, you know, when shit hits the yeah. fan. Baltimore was never up. So it's also not really going down that much. The value is really stable. So we're lucky with that. But nationally, a couple of slides, I'm just looking at them. Here's why people don't really need to freak out in the real estate sector. And I, I looked at this and I thought it was really compelling. Before 08, home prices were going up insane. Like every year, 10%, 10%, like from 2000 to 2005, it was just jumping. Hasn't done that. Okay, so price is probably not out of whack in terms of uh, appreciation. Two is there's not hardly any inventory in the US. In the United States, there's an inventory shortage of homes. Back when the bubble burst in 08, tons of inventory, that overbuilt, tons of options. They use a term because of, of Because of the reasons that led to the crash in the first place was all this financing, giving it to people that couldn't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, what was crazy, everyone was able to get a loan. And then even with that, there was tons of inventory in the market. There's just, it was, everything was overbuilt. It was a really bad situation. So that's another thing that's just apples and oranges. We have low inventory now. And when you have low inventory, prices tend to go up, right? If there's not as much. Of course. Yeah. Supply buyer, and demand. Yeah. So it's basic. Third is, Financing's cheaper now, and and the um, people are making more money. It requires less of your median income to buy a house now than it did in LA. That's another thing. And then one of the major ones is people aren't using their homes as ATMs anymore. Back before 2008, people were sucking out on average 200 to 300 billion a year home equity line of credit. Hmm. They're not doing that. There's a ton of equity in homes now. And then finally, here's a real interesting stat. In the last five recessions, and we're probably going to go into one, which is why I bring it up. In the last five, home values went up three of the last five. 1980, up 6%. 1981, up 3.5%. 1991, barely down 2%. 2001 recession, home values up 6%. And then, of course, in 2008, it dropped 20%. But just because you're in a recession for real estate, that doesn't necessarily mean your asset, if you are a property owner, is going to go down. And based on those things I said, hey, there's low inventory, people have equity, people are making more money. Um, the macro factors are pretty decent for the area. Now, what we don't know here in the U.S. is apparently we just lost 22 million jobs now. It grows every week. Yeah. That's a problem. So, so it, I, just, I, I just wanted to, to get your insight on that. Um, because I just found that it sort of led me to think about the market itself when I, when I saw that clip. Um, but I, you know, so many, it's more than just, it's more than just people looking at markets and making decisions at this point. I think people are just, uh, it's just emotions that are driving a ton of decisions, which is the worst way to do business. It doesn't matter what it is, but. I mean, that's what Warren Buffett always says is um, this, you know, when everyone else is fearful, it's time to be greedy. And you get vilified for saying things like that. Just, <laughs> but, it, but it's not, you know, I can see the, it's just true. I can see the, yeah, 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 yeah.
No, that's uh, I appreciate the, the the insight, man. That's good. Um, obviously, you're not you're not uh, you're not stressed right now um, about the markets or, or like you said in Baltimore in particular. But I guess we have to see what happens. Well, you can only focus on what you can control. I learned that a long time ago. All these external factors: job loss, virus, the rate of the spread, the politics, which is just gross. Um, yeah. All there's all these things you can't let that impact you. If you're a business owner or if you're in sales and your job is to you know, hit your quota or help XYZ customers, you can't let that interfere with you. You got to focus on what you can control. And that is, it's a yeah. lot more than you think, but it's hard. It's very tough to do. Do you find, um, do you find, uh, and this is something that I'm, I'm finding in, in my business and in my company, like we're having to try new things. We're having to do different positioning, just iterating on the marketing style, campaign, messaging, you know, the way we reach out, the conversations we have when we reach out. To be, to be quite honest, I found that because of coronavirus, it's made everyone just be a better marketer, a better salesperson, because now you're leading with empathy, you know, 10 out of 10 times, which you should have been doing anyways. And, I, and I've right. posted a couple times on this, like how to connect with people when everybody's stressed out and it's really just caring about what matters to them first and being authentic and being empathetic and having, and, and not being like, I don't know, just cheap and the traditional sales vibe that you get from not everybody, but a lot of people when they're selling. Oh yeah. So I think that it's just forcing people to be, and you know, like now the, the marketing campaigns and what, what I find works uh, and what I am doing now with, with my own, with my own sales and my own marketing is, is to take out any sort of feel of automation, being very careful about if you're sending an email blast, like you can, you can not only, if you're not hitting that right person, or if it's not a, a custom tailored message to that person, it's like, it's going to blow up in your face. And I've seen, you know, comments on, uh, on LinkedIn as a reference point, um, people saying like, you know, I got this message. And because I got this message at this time, while coronavirus, everyone's stressed out, Normally I just delete it, but because I got this insensitive, insensitive, it's probably just like a, you know, like a boilerplate uh, right. message blast out during this time. I'm not going to do business with you even when times are good because you're, you know, you're such an asshole, so into, whatever. So I think that it's just forcing everyone to be a little bit better, be a little bit more human. That's what I would hope. I think that everyone's stressed out, but I think that marketing and sales practice across the board, in my opinion, have definitely just made everyone a better uh, commercial uh, professional. Um, so I'm hoping that that kind of continues. Um, but I was wondering if uh, the way you uh, work with clients, the way you approach clients, the way you market to clients, has anything changed for, for Sure Group, for you know, your team? Yeah, and you, you kind of nailed it. The, you have, if you're not leading with empathy right now and connecting in an authentic one-on-one -on -one level with people that, that you're showing, that you really care, it's, it's probably not going to land. But the caveat is if you try to please everybody, all the time, you're gonna end up pleasing nobody. So you can't be afraid to still put yourself out there and brand what you feel is, is true, honest, and accurate, and a good reflection of the way you do business. So you can't be crippled by the fear that someone on LinkedIn might take a shot at you. That's mm -hmm. okay, and that's always, always gonna happen. So yeah, we're doing a lot of things differently. A lot, obviously, a lot of people don't wanna leave their house or go into someone else's house. When you're brokering real estate, that gets really interesting. So we're doing a ton of virtual things. Uh, as we talked about before, we're already pretty heavy on video and some technology, so we've had a leg up here. That's helpful, yeah. But what I told my team in, was that imagine, just imagine, Scott, if you could pull a lever and have all your competition take two months off. Can you imagine? What a gift. That's like winning the lottery. If I can pull this lever mm -hmm. and all my competition stops marketing, they go into a hole. That's kind of what we have right now. This right now is the best opportunity that we're probably going to see in a long time to really connect authentically with people, put yourself out there, do all the things you know you need to be doing, and you're going to start really catching, catching your, up to your competition or creating more separation from them. So that's the mindset that you have to have in times like this. Focus on what you can control, get it done. Your competition's sleeping. You need to be working twice as hard. I love it. And I, and I, and I love that, you know, you mentioned that you pull that lever, everyone takes two months off. The noise is so significantly reduced right now. So when you come in with an authentic message, that message can be heard. 
and it could have been authentic before, but it could have been, you know, you look at all the, it doesn't matter what industry you're in, you're just getting bombarded nonstop. And it's very hard. That's, that's the difficulty. That's the game of sales and marketing, right? So now you have the opportunity to deliver that authentic authenticity, your true self, your true brand, your true company, your true persona as a salesperson, um, and, and really get in with customers. So, you know what? I, I actually like that. I like that a lot. So now is not the time to, to relax. Now is it just a time to, and I, now I still think, that if you're selling something that people don't have the attitude or aptitude or ability to purchase, or they're just stressed, like I think that now is maybe not the time in some uh, some markets to focus on on building a connection to sell. I think it could just be building a connection to build a connection, which is something again is very important in sales. But building a connection to potentially potentially sell in the future. But if not, it doesn't matter because you're going to be seen as that person that actually cared about your clients. And I saw, I saw something that I actually really liked. It's like right now, there's, there's uh, the best way to separate your sales and marketing activities is to divide your clientele into two camps. One of them is the, the industry that just you know, laid off 200, 500, 1,000 employees. They're going bankrupt. You know, you, they're, they're not doing well. And that's the people that you reach out to. You say, hey, how are you doing? How are you, how's your family doing? Like, let's chat, you know, have you watched Tiger King on Netflix? <laughs> like, what, what's going on in your life right now? Like, and not a single word of, of commercial activity or anything. And that's one camp. And then the other camp is people that can still buy. Like, you know, if you're selling to Zoom, you're not going to stop selling. If you're selling to Netflix, you're not going to stop selling. If you're selling to probably in real estate, a lot of people that still, people still have to move. People still have to, you know, you're, you're not going to stop. But you just, it's just starting with empathy. So if you divide the, to those two camps, I think you're going to be pretty safe. But um, yeah, you're right. The opportunity is is definitely right there. Very, very. I like the I like the lever analogy. I've never heard that before, but it's it's valid. This is like you know, everyone's quiet. Right. Yeah. Um, that's all I got for for uh, for casual chit chat about coronavirus and and real estate, man. I um, uh, you know, you know this. I'm sure you 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 we did this once before, and I screwed it up, and that was my bad. But uh, this is a, this is a take two, and I'm happy we did it. And I think that. I hope you're happy with this. I, I the, the stuff we talked about and chatted about, we didn't get into in the first one. So I'm, I'm happy that we went there. Um, but uh, the, the way I like to close it off, um, I like to, you know, this is an origin story about you, about how you got to where you are today. So a couple of life lessons um, to pull like out of you. Uh, one question I like to ask um, is obviously you know, a lesson that you tell your younger self. Can you still hear me, by the way? I feel like I hear my earbud, ear pods dying. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Yeah, you're okay, good. Cool. You're good. Cool, cool, cool. Um, tell my younger self. Um, I forget what I, how I answered this last time. <laughs> but I think I gave you a good answer. But I think that the biggest one for me is never stop investing in yourself with the, with the types of training that you're going to need to excel in business. Because there's no better investment than investing in yourself. You can buy all this stuff, you know, stocks, bonds, legitimate investments, but nothing's going to pay the dividends of you trying to get better with your skills, with your technique, with your attitude, with just learning from people standing on the shoulders of giants who've been there before you. Mm -hmm. So I was lucky that I, I did kind of do that as a 22 year old. I was in like this sales training all the time and I never stopped. I can only imagine if I started doing that at 18 while I was in college, I would have been that much further along. So like what I look forward to telling my son who's one years old is invest in yourself, start now. And of course, no one year old, not half, no, most college kids don't know what they want to do when they grow up. But when you do know, you go all in and you never stop investing in the training. I think, I think the answer was along those lines, to be honest, but it's a good answer. And I think that that's why I remember this. It allowed me to easily dovetail into the next question, which is where do you go to learn? Um, you know, mentors, podcasts, books, audibles, whatever, doesn't matter. Um, what's, uh, what's your go-to? Well, I'm on podcasts a lot these days. Um, and I read a lot of books. I have some behind me. This is what I'm reading right now. This is an old one. This is a Steve Jobs biography mm. here. Thick boy. He's a thick boy. Um, but where do I go to learn? Well, luckily, I'm still really close with a bunch of sales consulting friends of mine who see all kinds of unique things from different perspectives. So I like to take what other industries are doing and pull it into my industry, which is a good tactic, um, not just for sales, but for anything. What's working in 
you know, big tech that we could use in our neck of the world. Um, so I like to be around people who sharpen, sharpen me yeah. up, you know, people sharpen people. But I listen to a lot of podcasts, a lot of sales stuff. I mean, I watch a lot of your content, Scott, which is why I kept reaching out to you. And thanks so much for having me. Um, you, you, you hype me up too much on this interview. <laughs> Well, it's just true. Like I saw your stuff. I'm like this guy's on top of his stuff. I want to get on there and just throw myself out there. But like Tim Ferriss, I'm not sure if you listen to his podcast. He's I do. Awesome. Yeah, I love it. Um, I love it. He's one of my favorites um, currently. So I'd say podcast books, and then just being around people who can make you better. Yeah, very good. Um, if people want to get in touch with you, uh, where where do they go? Is it, you know a social website? What's uh, what's your thing? I'm easy to find um, my kind of hashtag name across all social media. is just my name, Andrew Undum. I think I'm at Undum on Instagram, but you can find us at suresalesgroup.com. And if there's ever anything I can do for anyone watching, if you want to pick my brain on anything we're doing, I'm always happy to, to connect because uh, I'm sure there's things I could learn from you too. And I really appreciate the opportunity and the platform that Scott provided to, to share a little bit today. So yeah, no, that was Thank good. You. That was good. That's all I got, man. Thank you so much for doing that again. <laughs> Home office, quarantine edition. That's all for today. Thanks again for joining me on another episode of the Success Story Podcast. You can download or stream this podcast wherever podcasts are available, including iTunes, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and many others. You can also watch this podcast on YouTube. If you haven't already, please subscribe and share this podcast with your friends, family, coworkers, and peers. Please leave us a rating on iTunes. It takes about 30 seconds as it allows other people to find our podcast and lets our amazing guests reach even more people with their message. And remember, any rating is fine as long as it contains five stars. I'm Scott Clary from the Success Story Podcast, signing off.